Good afternoon. Welcome to this roundtable discussion, Challenges to Security and Stability in Central and East Europe, Building New European Security Architecture. My name is Bradley Woodworth, and here in the Macmillan Center, I coordinate Yale's program in, uh, in Baltic Studies. So it's my pleasure to introduce the participants of the roundtable today. Uh, first, we'll be speaking His, Excell His Excellency Ambassador Andres uh, Pildigovic. He is the permanent representative of the Republic of Latvia to the United Nations. Mr. Pildigovic began his country's, uh, be became his country's ambassador to the UN in September 2018. Before this appointment, he served from 2013 as State Secretary in Latvia's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. From 2007 to 2012, he was ambassador to the United States. And I think we, we met in that role in some capacity. He's held various positions in the office of the president of Latvia, also in Latvia's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, beginning in 1994. Latvia is a leader in information and cybersecurity in Europe, and Ambassador Piligovic is, is an active member of the UN Group of Friends on e-governance and cybersecurity. Next, we'll hear from Mr. Pavel Radomski. Mr. Radomski is Deputy Permanent Representative of the Republic of Poland to the United Nations. He was part of the team that helped Poland become elected as non-permanent member of the UN Security Council for 2018-2019. He has represented Poland in numerous debates at the UN Security Council on topics including peace and security in Europe, conflict prevention, and children in armed conflict. He's an active participant in UN debates and discussions on other topics such as disarmament and human rights. Ambassador Yuri Sergeyev is a senior fellow here at the Macmillan Center, and we must thank him for putting this whole roundtable together. He served as Ukraine's ambassador to the United Nations from 2007 to 2016. Prior to that, he served as ambassador to Greece and Albania, ambassador to France and UNESCO, and as first deputy, deputy minister state secretary in Ukraine's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. His experience related to service in the UN is vast. I'll just mention his work as vice chairman of the Peace Building Commission from 2011-2012, uh, and that he was an elected member of the UN Security Council in 2016 and 2017. He was an academic prior to ent entering government service from 1981 to 1992. He was a professor um, of philology at Taras Shevchenko State University. And in addition to his work here at Yale, Ambassador Gave has continued his academic work uh, as a visiting professor at the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. Uh, and so, Yuri, you will be moderating, so I'll turn the time over to you. Thank you, Brett. <clears throat> uh, thank you for co-hosting uh, roundtables, on, particularly on this uh, important issue as um, the security, stability in the region uh, of the Central East in Europe. And uh, of course, in the region where you are expert in. Professor Bradley is one of the leading uh, experts in the United States on Estonia. He speaks fluent <coughs> Estonian, he knows literature, whatever. And <coughs> today he will not only be a host, but uh, I expect him to contribute something from the American-Estonian point of view on the, <coughs> uh, on the issue. I advise, I advise um, uh, all our panelists, <coughs> their guests here, to present briefly their vision from their perspective on the <coughs> uh, building of new architecture of security uh, in Europe. And um, I give the floor first to <coughs> Ambassador of Latvia, alphabetic order, United Nations <coughs> principal, oh. Latvia, then, <laughs> then, then you. Protocol as well. <laughs> Protocol as well, yeah. <coughs> Please, you have a floor. Well, honorable professor, honorable ambassador, thank you so much for inviting me back to Yale. It's a pleasure to visit uh, this uh, remarkable university after eight year interval and to reflect on uh, what we have achieved uh, since our last uh, discussion a few years ago. And I also do want to thank, thank from the start uh, Professor Keggy and all supporters of the Baltic Studies here sure. at this, this university. It's really very important and timely contribution to our transatlantic uh, debate and to our transatlantic ties. Uh, I want uh, to first mention a few important dates uh, to give the context for our discussion. 
We just finished celebration of the centennial of the Baltic States uh, last November. Latvia was the last country to mark centennial of the modern Latvian Democratic Republic. In a few weeks, we will mark uh, 70th anniversary of the NATO alliance, uh, the, probably the most successful, most uh, efficient alliance in the history of the human kind. And uh, this anniversary coincides with the 15th anniversary of the Latvian and Baltic membership in the alliance. I also want to mention that uh, Euro has passed 20th anniversary, and uh, that coincides with the 5th anniversary of the Latvian membership in, in the common European currency. So those anniversaries, they give a quite, uh, quite good uh, platform to reflect what is uh, right, what has been done correctly, what is missing, what are the challenges and, and opportunities for, for the future. Uh, I probably will not surprise you, uh, being a Cold War baby, uh, a person which has witnessed uh, at the students' times collapse of the Soviet Union, I am a, I am a full believer in the correctness and the rightness of the concept of Europe whole, free and at peace. We've been uh, building this Europe for the last uh, almost 30 years, and I think that this is a very sound and very credible uh, foundation for the future European architecture, uh, which is fully anchored, uh, first of all, within NATO as uh, the pillar and as the foundation, cornerstone of the European and transatlantic uh, security architecture. Uh, we uh, fully believe that NATO is existential, transatlantic partnership with the United States, with Canada, with Iceland is, is fundamental for the future of European con continent. And uh, we are tirelessly working to build this, this foundation. Uh, we will have uh, the summit uh, at the end of the year in London to reflect on this 70th anniversary. Uh, we certainly in a very uh, important implementation stage of the Wales summit uh, decisions, of the Warsaw summit decisions in 2016. We believe that we are progressing quite uh, nicely on implementation and enhanced forward presence in the Baltic states and Poland has been proceeding uh, according to the plans. Uh, we, uh, we are doing what we had uh, decided. We, uh, we are building up uh, necessary infrastructure necessary command structures, we are building uh, missing capabilities in the region, uh, maritime, uh, air defense, air controls. Uh, we are working uh, a lot on the interoperability uh, of, the, of the NATO allies. Uh, we are open door policy remains fundamental in this respect and we are very pleased that the last country of the original Vilnius 10 uh, we'll join the alliance shortly, and I mean North Macedonia. The protocol has been signed a few weeks ago, and we believe that uh, further procedures will follow quite smoothly. And uh, we work a lot on uh, so-called uh, hybrid, uh, hybrid threats, including cybersecurity, which has been mentioned in the introduction, as one of the probably biggest vulnerabilities of the, of the modern world. Uh, Classical conventional warfare is uh, probably not a very realistic scenario. Uh, overall, the region uh, of the Baltic Sea uh, is uh, probably one of the safest in, in the world, one of the most stable in the world, thanks to a large extent to the uh, correct decisions on NATO and EU enlargements, which have eliminated any element of unpredictability. Uh, the region is stable in a sense that uh, the borders are clear, there are no open territorial issues, there are, very, there are no uh, foreign military bases in the region. Uh, the, the rules of the game are clear to every country uh, in, in, in the region, be it uh, EU NATO members or uh, countries like Russia or Belarus, which are, which are obviously outside of, the, of our transatlantic structures. So, uh, just a few words to 
to to conclude that uh, the policies of the 90s and early uh, decades of this century, we believe, have been very correct. Uh, we certainly applaud all uh, Republican and Democratic presidents which have advanced those goals. We believe that this transatlantic uh, link is very essential. And uh, just to give you historical perspective, uh, in the 20s and 30s, uh, first two decades of our independence, we, our leadership of that time thought that being non-aligned, being neutral, will help us to weather international storms. We had thought, our leaders at that time had thought that by staying outside of the alliances of st security agreements, we will be protected. Uh, uh, we invested that time enormously in our defense. The defense budget in the 30s and 20s of the last century was about 20%. But uh, but the country was not very democratic uh, in the late 30s. The parliament was disbanded, and when the, we were faced with the ultimatums from the East and invasions from the West, uh, Soviet and Nazi, uh, very very small number of politicians were in charge. There were no checks and balances, and uh, at the end. Uh, we failed miserably with that uh, pre-war policies. Uh, we lost one third of the population. We lost for two decades our statehood. Uh, de facto, the Euro countries continued to exist. We had embassies in London and Washington, but uh, de facto countries were under Soviet control and our Soviet occupation. And of course, uh, as you know very well, uh, international structures also were quite ineffective. We were members of League of Nations, but uh, those structures had no any enforcement mechanisms to stop uh, aggression by uh, Soviet Union against Finland or Soviet occupation and against the Baltic states. So uh, we uh, from early 90s, we took very clear and very deliberate decision to be uh, proactive, to be aligned, to be an uh, active member of the international collective security of international organizations. We joined basically every uh, multilateral structure of the democratic Western world including uh, NATO, including European Union, OECD, and uh, UN, of course, was the first institution, and we are trying to, uh, to play active role in building this rule-based, law-based uh, international order. Uh, we are participate in, uh, as an example, in MINUSMA operation in Mali, one of the most difficult uh, peace enforcement operations under the UN, Aegis, and, uh, and uh, this is our blueprint, uh, our Bible of the, of the foreign policy. I mentioned a few times European Union. Uh, it's for us another very important existential structure. Uh, our British colleagues and friends might have different opinions about Brexit, but for Latvians, and I hope that I can speak also on behalf of Lithuanians and Estonians, uh, these are like r right and left hands, uh, NATO and the European Union equally. But when it comes to security, definitely uh, NATO comes first. Uh, European Union plays more complementary role. Uh, common European uh, and security policy within the European Union has been uh, growing, uh, it has been more articulated since uh, since implementation of the Lisbon Treaty uh, over the last 10 years, but still uh, it is uh, emerging and the EU 28 or EU 27 is still um, less a coherent group in terms of the security policies and we have less uh, efficient security structures, so we cannot rely fully on them. Though we are certainly interested in building more uh, bridges and interoperability between NATO and European structures. 
particularly uh, on intelligence sharing, particularly on facing of the hybrid threats. And, uh, and one uh, example of uh, practical implementation of uh, interoperability is so-called military Schengen all kind of uh, diplomatic uh, and uh, diplomatic clearance procedure arrangements to facilitate movement of troops, movement of military personnel, uh, equipment, uh, some capabilities within the transatlantic uh, space uh, without uh, time delays and other bureaucratic hindrances. Uh, uh, we certainly, as I said, uh, see considerable vulnerabilities related to the uh, social uh, weaponization of the social media, uh, hybrid, uh, hybrid threats, cyber threats. Uh, these issues are being, uh, we have faced uh, as one of the first countries attacks in uh, cyberspace uh, as early as 2004 and five in the Baltics. Uh, Estonians probably have carried uh, the brunt of those attacks, but we have seen quite a lot of sophisticated uh, attacks against uh, our uh, banks, against our government infrastructure. And we work uh, a lot on raising the general awareness of the member states, of the general public about those vulnerabilities, be it uh, electoral processes, be it uh, social media and uh, uh, centers of excellence in Tallinn and Riga uh, are quite dedicated to, to this work on cyber and on uh, strategic communications. So uh, we, uh, to sum up a little bit, uh, we think that uh, the sound foundations of the uh, European security architecture are quite sound, uh, NATO and European Union. Uh, regardless of what we read in the press or what we debate in our parliaments, the foundations are quite, quite sound and solid. Uh, we are facing uh, a lot of challenges, of course, resurgent Russia, rise of China, uh, difficult protracted conflicts in Syria, in Afghanistan, uh, of course, uh, migration uh, crisis has been dealt uh, over the last few years, uh, the current numbers of flow of uh, migrants is controlled, contained, but, but uh, we certainly would like to face those challenges together. Uh, unity among allies for us is a very important uh, element and uh, we, we uh, committed to uh, both alliances and we think that uh, uh, we're going to have a good debate uh, over this year in a few weeks in Washington during a ministerial meeting and in December between our leaders. Uh, uh, we don't uh, think that uh, we probably should not open Pandora box with a new strategic concept. Uh, we better focus on implementation of the last summit declarations. That's maybe a very uh, short uh, introduction to identify some of uh, the achievements and some of the challenges that we are facing and I look forward for the for the discussion and thank you again for inviting me. Thank you Ambassador <clears throat> Rigovic, thank you. Really it was concise but comprehensive so you pointed <clears throat> some important issues and I will ask <clears throat> well to to be more details on some of them uh, sharing with uh, your experience in all these years. And of course, uh, it's good that you mentioned the history when uh, you, you switched, uh, the Baltic states switched from the uh, uh, non aligned status um, to be allied. Uh, it's interesting what was the catalyst uh, for this decision, what happened at the time. So, but we'll come back to that. <coughs> uh, and now uh, I have a pleasure and honor to. <coughs> Uh, ask to take uh, the floor, my good friend Paweł Radomski, <coughs> Deputy Representative of Poland to the United Nations and a member of the Security Council. Okay. Thank you. Until Thank the you. end of the year. Until <coughs> the end of this year. Thank you, Ambassador Sergei Yuri. Uh, I'm uh, very grateful and, and proud to, to be here at Yale University. 
Uh, my wife is proud of me as well. And um, uh, this is really great opportunity and honor, uh, I guess, mostly to discuss, to have chance to talk about uh, um, the situation in Europe, in Central and Eastern Europe, in security aspects. I would sign fully under Ambassador Piltegovic's uh, statement. We share, I guess, the Absolutely. perspective on, on challenges which, uh, which our region uh, faces. Uh, right now, uh, we, we have the same, really the same approach towards NATO, uh, um, towards EU role, and uh, and the um, problems which we face from Eastern neighbor. Um, that's what what unites us, that definitely, and and shapes our politics. But let me also start with uh, this small um, caveat, I would say, that we are coming from New York, from the UN, and it changes the perspective. I, I spent already five years in uh, dealing with the, with, the, with the Security Council mostly, and happily, uh, European affairs are not in the center of the Security Council. Uh, and that's good, I think. Uh, the, we, we focus on uh, Middle East, on Africa, um, and uh, of course we regularly are coming back in the Security Council to the situation in Ukraine, uh, but it serves mostly as an opportunity to, uh, to recall, to rebuild awareness of the rest of the world about the situation, not to allow to forget uh, that the conflict exists, that the conflict is costly in humanitarian dimension and uh, um, economic and uh, political. Uh, but in, in practice, it doesn't bring much progress and uh, doesn't have, doesn't create, doesn't create a chance for this multilateral involvement from the UN in the, in the high degree. Uh, the one, one reason, of course, is, is veto power uh, held by, by, by one of the P5 members directly interested. Uh, but uh, so, so our, let's say, my remarks on, on I'm, I'm kind of going into the sh shoes of my colleagues from Brussels and from Warsaw when I try to talk about NATO and European Union. But uh, definitely NATO is the fundamental uh, structure, fundamental organization for Poland. Uh, for us, it's 20 years since we joined, uh, together with Czech Republic and Hungary in 1999. And uh, we are definitely the most enthusiastic pro-NATO members, I, I would say, um, uh, together, of course, with Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. Um, and we see the role of the NATO as a uh, um, um, as, a, as an organization based on the principle of solidarity. Article 5 of, of the uh, Transatlantic Treaty is of crucial importance for us. We also, especially now, in this um, not easy climate of, of, of international relations, we underline the need for, for unity. Uh, despite press comments on, on divisions, uh, transatlantic divisions. Uh, we see NATO united, we see NATO strong, and that's the only way we, we perceive and we, we, we approach this, this organization. And the third element is uh, ability to face new, new uh, threats. Uh, Ambassador mentioned hybrid threats, uh, dis disinformation, uh, of course terrorism, that's, that's already the longer story. Uh, we face our neighbor uh, not hesitating to manifest openly willingness to use force, uh, which means we should respond uh, very steadily and be prepared military to, to, response as well, to respond as well. So that's why this format of NATO enhanced presence in, in 
Lat Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia and Poland is very strongly supported con con concept by, by our politicians, by our military. Um, on the other hand, we do not want to divide NATO as a, a, a security actor from, the, from other international actors present and active in Europe, mostly European Union. <coughs> and here uh, we want to combine our forces, uh, combine potential which countries, EU members, and being at the same time NATO members, can can use and uh, for the for the good of of, of the European Union uh, when when uh, need need arises, so we observe and we support all the efforts which are undertake, undertaken recently to to make it possible to to better coordinate among EU members the way we uh, we build our capacities we modernize our armies. Uh, and we, th there is this structure, new, relatively new structure of permanent, this is called PESCO, I al always remember the, uh, the, the, the short version, but not the long version. Let me the full name is Permanent Structured Cooperation. Uh, it's not easy to understand how it works, I, I, I have to admit. But the, the, the basic, the, the fundament, beyond this, this, this concept is to allow, allow us to coordinate better. And we can voluntarily uh, take a promise that we will, let's say, modernize our Air Force. And it will be available for other countries if, need, if it will be necessary. And the new part of that is that this promise may be, should be measured and should be uh, executed. I mean, the, this is not this is voluntary contribution, but legally binding. We cannot then, after year after that, say no, no, it was just you know political gesture. No, it should be measured. It should be sure and available when time comes. So uh, that's one of the parts we see. We see in practice uh, this EU involvement in. Uh, in securing European borders uh, in Med Mediter Mediterranean Sea, where there is a, a, a naval force mission uh, called SOFIA, acting and uh, um, operating close to the Libyan coast. And there is also NATO mission acting there. And they are supporting each other, which is very, very, that's one of the practical dimension, very visible and very practical and very important right now. Um, what, what can I add? I, I was thinking also about OSCE, Organization of Security Co Cooperation in Europe, uh, which has, of course, completely different nature, taking its geographical uh, um, um, area, the, the, the membership, uh, of, of course, much bigger. <coughs> but currently, with involvement of OSC in Ukraine, that's the only international presence, only reliable source, which allows us to, to, to see, to have uh, reports from the region of conflict in eastern Ukraine. And uh, it definitely increases the role of OSCE and uh, much stronger connects this organization as well with our internal, with our external security policies. So I guess I can stop here. And uh, that's the very general picture, um, uh, similar <coughs> to my dear colleague. Um, and we'll, we'll be open for the questions. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the uh, issues you raised. Of course, it, it will be very important during the discussion to understand how the mechanism of coordination uh, is working uh, uh, um, to harmonize the projects coming from NATO and European Union. And now I'm giving the floor to a good friend of mine, Bradley Woodworth. Well, his vision from Estonia, sitting in the United States. 
thank you, thank you for putting this together. Thank you all for coming. Um, speaking to all of us, we're very grateful to have such distinguished guests and give us an opportunity to, to hear push, from you. Push, 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 push. Okay. You have great meeting silence. Green is going. No, it's green. Oh, I can't. Oh, I see right here. So again, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, we're, we're Estonia's permanent representative to the United Nations, Mr. Sven Jurgensen here. He would likely point out that this week marks the 15th anniversary of Estonia, as well as Latvian Latvian, becoming members uh, of NATO. Estonia's Ministry of Foreign Affairs emphasizes that the country's strong commitment to NATO, recognizing it as the main guarantor of its security. Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014 pushed Estonia to increase defense spending, and beginning in the year 2012, Estonia has spent 2% and can, continues to do so this year, slightly over 2% of its GDP on defense, and has been taking part in NATO peacekeeping missions since 1995. From 2014 to the present, there, have been, there has been an increase in the number of countries contributing <coughs> to NATO's Baltic air po policy policing mission, which protects the airspace of the three Baltic countries. These missions are performed from bases in Amari, Estonia, which is not far from Tallinn, and Shiolai in northern Lithuania. Estonia's foreign ministry uh, adds, um, it just gives a little bit of context of the, of the dedication uh, and commitment Estonia has to these international um, institutions, particularly NATO. In the course of the past 10 years, we, Estonia, have rendered de development and humanitarian aid totaling over 25 million euros. Estonia has security cooperation with such important NATO partners as Ukraine and Georgia, and also with Afghanistan and Iraq. In the last 10 years, approximately 2,800 servicemen from the Estonian Defense Forces participated in foreign missions. Today, there are 100 Estonian, Estonian servicemen taking part in nine field operations in five countries and regions, including some 40 servicemen in the NATO Resolute Support Mission in Afghanistan. We are convinced that such operations ensuring peace and stability are an important component of maintaining international security, and we intend to maintain our, partic our participation at the, in them at the current level at a minim minimum. Given Estonia's very small size and population, it's just um, 1.3 million people, its defense ultimately rests on other states' commitment to, col uh, to collective defense and to Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, the, the North Atlantic Treaty. Estonia is home to the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. This was established in 2008. This organization with personnel from a number of countries, analysts and educators from the military, government, academia, and industry, conducts research, holds live fire cyber defense exercises as well. Beginning last year, it is responsible for identifying and coordinating education and training in cyber defense for all parts of NATO. So a men mention uh, by Professor, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, Ambassador Pilikovic was uh, made earlier of Estonia's um, being subject to cyber attacks. In 2007, Estonia was subjected to a significant cyber attack from Russia. On. This was directed against institutions of government, security, media, and finance. There's significant cooperation between Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia on defense. There's a joint Baltic Defense College in Tartu, Estonia, operated and financed by the three countries' defense ministries, and there's a joint uh, Baltic battalion, Baltbat, an infantry, an infantry uh, battalion based in <coughs> Adagi, Latvia, that is part of NATO's defense force. It should also be noted that beyond the area of defense, uh, Baltic cooperation in political matters perhaps leaves some expectations unfulfilled. Much greater attention, at least in Estonia, is however, paid to participation in all possible international organizations. There's, I, there is a developing closer sense in, th in the three countries of a shared North European identity. Here speaking, um, I, I can say at least for Estonian, I believe in Latv the case applies to Latvia and Lithuania as well, a shared, sen a shared sense of North European identity uh, between the Baltic countries with the Nordic countries. Though firm and persevering political ties um, could also see greater development and resilience. There is a council of Baltic states, however. Latvian political scientist Daunis Auras concludes that the primary identity framework for citizens in the Baltic states remains Baltic rather than Nordic, European, or something else. Perhaps there is momentum, he writes. The Baltic states are gradually shifting north and west away from Russia, a process that Russia's annexation of Crimea 
has hastened. Estonia knows it, above all, needs friends in Europe that share its views. Last month, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Estonian Parliament, the Rigikoku, Mr. Marko Michelson, in remarks in the Parliament, said this about Estonia's security. At a time when Russia is attempting to use force to expand its own borders, and China has as its aim to become a global leader, there is simply no alternative but close cooperation and vigorous joint efforts with the nation states of the European Union. The peace that reigns in Europe only confirms the essential role that is played by NATO's Washington Treaty and Article 5 within it. He added that there is dangerous uncertainty and tensions within the Western alliance, and these could potentially cause cooperation to weaken or even lead to the disintegration of NATO. And these remarks he just made four weeks ago in the Estonian parliament. For Estonia and for its security, such a such an image, the disintegration of NATO, would spell disaster. The end of the security is it has assiduously worked for since the restoration of its independence in 1991. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I spoke to the ambassador <clears throat> of Estonia. I invited him to, to the panel. So uh, now they are in a serious process to be, to be elected to the Security Council as well. So competing with the friendly nation of Romania for this seat. Well. <clears throat> We wish them both well to find a solution how to, <clears throat> and he apologized that not to be with us, but <clears throat> um, Brett um, exactly discovered uh, <clears throat> the, the major points of the <clears throat> Estonian uh, policy as to the security. So let's start uh, um, some, uh, some talks, some exchange on <clears throat> some particular important issues to, uh, um, to understand what's going on. So, uh, um, Particularly during the last um, couple of years in Europe, uh, the idea of uh, the um, reconstruction of the architecture appeared. Even some of the countries, uh, they raised the idea to have the European army. Recently, um, the idea was sounded again on the top level during the Munich conference <coughs> on security. Uh, my question is very simple. <coughs> uh, what is wrong with the old uh, European security architecture. Why the uh, resh reshuffling is needed? Well, yeah. Thank you. I, I will start and maybe I'll uh, start my answer by answering to your first question about uh, why Latvians and Estonians and Poland have okay. been so decisive uh, upon the moment of regaining of independence, uh, going away from neutrality, from non-alignment. And I think, uh, first of all, uh, this is our bitter historical experience of the Soviet and Nazi occupations. When we lost our legitimate place uh, by, at the international table, we were mentioned at the moment of the dissolution of the League of Nations in 1945, the last time as in international entities, but, but of course we were not invited to San Francisco to create the UN. And, uh, and uh, this uh, very clear position, as I said, is based on the notion of Europe whole, free and at peace. We, we fully committed to the, not only to the UN Charter, but to the Paris Charter of OSCE in 1990, that we fully reject uh, any notion of the spheres of influence. We fully reject any, we, we rejected for more than a decade offers from Russia about cross guarantees. Uh, there were proposals that the US, uh, Germany and Russia could provide a kind of cross guarantees to the Baltic states. And yeah, we said, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it, it was a conversation between Yeltsin and Clinton. Yes. And Clinton rejected it saying, uh, we, I'm not a, a we, holder. We were very clear. And uh, we are, don't, please don't be confused. On the one level, we are probably the most strongest proponents of regional cooperation in the world. And Baltic region is probably one of the most integrated in the world. We are the biggest trade partners among ourselves. We are members of currency. We are, in terms of uh, cross-border acquisitions, takeovers, uh, this is the most homogeneous region. Except Russia and Belarus, we are internal, fully internal part of the European Union. We are uh, Finland and uh, Sweden are privileged partners of NATO. We would love to see them in the NATO family one day, 
but of course that's up to the to the governments and peoples of those countries so we are proponents of regional regionalism modern regionalism and integration but we are very strongly against uh, uh, division of European security space. We think that this is disastrous proposal. This is uh, historically we have seen uh, disastrous mistakes and crimes committed uh, with uh, divi div dividing of European security space. And uh, maybe one more aspect, uh, of course, is the attitude to history. In Latvia, we in the Baltics, we've been dealing a lot with the uncovering the whole truth of the world wars, of the Soviet occupation, of the Nazi occupation, of the collaboration, of the Holocaust. Uh, very difficult, very controversial, uh, painful, um, unpleasant. Uh, a lot of crimes have been committed on our soil during the, those uh, tragic events, but we did it. When it comes to our big neighbor, to Russia, the process hasn't happened. And uh, with this kind of attitude of Russia, even before Russian invasion against Ukraine, we, we had been thinking very clearly that uh, we have to build this uh, European future security architecture together with democratic countries which are open towards past, which are committed to the same values, rule-based international order, and ready to defend that. Uh, coming uh, specifically to your second question, uh, we don't think that fundamentals are wrong. Uh, of course, we all have to invest in our security. In that sense, we agree with President Trump that 2% is the necessary threshold. Uh, it's, it's not right that uh, quite a number of NATO allies is not paying enough for defense. Mm -hmm. And defense means defense. Uh, there is no EU defense and NATO defense. Armed forces are, are the same. <coughs> uh, defense budgets are the same. And uh, we, are, we don't believe much in a notion more for less. You mm -hmm. cannot do more with the less resources. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, in the times of economic contraction and world economic crisis, we had to do it. Uh, 2008, when we had quite a dramatic uh, economic downturn, but this is not sustainable in the long run. So uh, we think that uh, all countries should contribute in the spending, and I uh, think we have substantiated this with numbers. We are all in a 2% club when it comes to spending, but of course we could do more uh, within Europe in terms of the building of the interoperability. Mm -hmm. But uh, please don't forget that in European Union we have very diverse uh, countries with different backgrounds. We have Malta with specific uh, security policy outlook. We have Ireland with triple lock uh, policies, so they cannot do anything unless, unless there is Security Council resolution at all. This is almost in the Constitution. And, uh, and of course, we have Sweden and Finland, which is a bit different situation. So uh, we think foundations are, are solid and right. But of course, we, in order to uh, perpetuate our alliances, of course, we have to deliver on the implementation of the, of the uh, summit declarations. We should implement, uh, fill those niche capabilities which are missing. Uh, we should uh, we should uh, prove to everyone that NATO is not a paper tiger, that this is a really a living organism. And we do it by enlargement, and we are doing also that by deepening and working with the uh, with, uh, European Union. Of course, I haven't mentioned also this uh, Turkey and Cyprus relationship, which sometimes complicates uh, agreement on some political issues, but uh, I think we are creative enough and uh, to, to work uh, maximum possible uh, and, and to deliver to, to, our, to our nation's security. Okay. Thank you. Well, <coughs> moving again? Yeah, yeah. Because the, the, the first part, the, the question was why we think now about something alternative to NATO. 
uh, European army or this kind of ideas. So we, we cannot pretend that we don't see the elephant in the room. Uh, I mean, we live now in a different climate than we've been five years ago, than, we, than we've been in the thinking about security policy, about transatlantic relations for a very long time. And uh, this continuity of thinking, of this, this, this feeling of security, of the guarantee of the, of the continuity of this architecture, these times are maybe not over, but uh, the, the, the scenario of change became much more uh, possible. Uh, so we, the, the transatlantic, uh, the, the European security, which is based on trans transatlantic relations, in fact is based on the involvement of the United States. With the United States asking rightly about more involvement from U Europe and uh, signaling a uh, readiness to quite drastically change its involvement, uh, it, it builds definitely new dynamics, new way of thinking about all the, all the architecture. So I guess it's, it's one of the reasons why um, right now um, some of the, let's say, European countries, some of the leading European countries are seriously considering these scenarios what if we will have to take care about our own security? Just, you know, if, if transatlantic relation will be much more weak, uh, much weaker. Uh, so that's, that's definitely, I guess, maybe obvious, maybe uh, clear, but definitely worth to mention a uh, reason why we think about different things. Yeah, I agree that <coughs> uh, the general security environment has changed. And uh, both the European Union and NATO first, they are changing and adapting to the new realities. NATO has changed <coughs> for the couple of last years dramatically. Well, coming back to the, uh, uh, to the background, what it was uh, created for, to defend values. Brad, you want to, or we move? Listening to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, okay. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Moving ahead, uh, moving ahead, what is the biggest challenge uh, uh, in the region in terms of military political? If it is conventional war challenge or nuclear threats or uh, uh, you understand what I'm speaking about because the deployment of nu uh, nukes in Kaliningrad, <coughs> well, with uh, <coughs> intermediate range uh, coverage and uh, <coughs> middle uh, <coughs> range coverage and disagreements between the United States and Russia on, on this treaty, uh, what does it mean for the security? So, conventional military political challenge <coughs> uh, or mm, uh, nuclear threat or what is more challenging or both of them? Well, if I may start, uh, we believe that the most uh, palpable threat is uh, hy hybrid. Uh, we uh, study very carefully the trend, this trend for the last, have been studying for the last 10 years. And just, just a few examples. Uh, lately, we had the military, NATO military drills in one of the NATO countries. And with the permission of one uh, military force of a NATO mem member country, I will not disclose the name, uh, we simulated uh, interaction with the soldiers of that armed unit mm -hmm. through social media. And uh, believe me or not, but the soldiers left their positions. <laughs> as, as simple as that. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are similar uh, issues mm -hmm. r related to the uh, black market of the social media with the weaponization of the artificial intelligence, uh, uh, using of the robots. I don't know if this is, uh, have been discussed in this auditorium or not, but for instance, when it comes to Estonia, to certain topics, not to every topic, 
but a couple of years ago, close to 80% of the social media materials in Estonia have been registered that they are produced by robots, not by real people. Uh, when things have been exposed, uh, now on certain subjects, uh, numbers have gone down to 60 and 40 percent. Mm -hmm. But uh, when it comes to elections, when it comes to political decisions, when it comes to the uh, political discourse in our countries, in our democracies, we see, we see not only uh, positive and light elements related to social media, uh, but uh, certain uh, shadow and certain vulnerabilities. And uh, uh, we certainly are interested in uh, uh, raising public awareness, raising awareness of our general public. At our schools, we start to e publish uh, special books for, for, for young students to, to understand the uh, consequences and uh, interconnections between, between uh, uh, cyber and uh, manipulation and uh, media literacy and etc. We see those sort of more uh, acute vulnerabilities. Uh, and uh, I can leave with you a few brochures from the Latvian Riga-based NATO Center of Excellence uh, dealing with those, those issues. Uh, we have seen that uh, major companies, uh, media platforms, dealing with social media are not really interested in, in uh, hy hygiene, kind of cyber hygiene. Mm -hmm. Some of them are based, uh, their business models are based in uh, uh, tactics or uh, abuse of, of, of those tools. And uh, and uh, for uh, for uh, price of the lunch, you can you can uh, you can on the one hand simulate I don't know ten one hundred likes on on your on your Twitter account, and you can uh, simulate uh, hostile uh, attacks on on some of your uh, media platforms. So uh, very inexpensive, very dangerous, malicious acts can be done. Uh, and can produce and incite violence that can be done against armed forces, it can be done against minorities, and can be done in peacekeeping situations. And uh, uh, we, should be, we should be really vigilant about them. When it comes to uh, conventional uh, threats, we believe that our region is quite uh, well covered, uh, enhanced forward presence it works. Uh, we have we are fine-tuning. We need to fine-tune certain things. Of course, we as I said, we would love to have Finland and Sweden in NATO. Mm -hmm. That would be a kind of strategic uh, uh, decision which would fully consolidate security in the Nordic Baltic space. But, but even without that, uh, we are working very nicely. But uh, from our point of view, the biggest gender uh, g uh, danger is these uh, frozen and non-frozen conflicts in Ukraine, in Moldova, in Georgia, uh, and uh, we certainly urge our friends, allies, and partners in all international organizations to not to take those conflicts as a kind of uh, fait accompli. Uh, we we need to focus all political attention to, 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 to deal with these uh, very dangerous uh, conflicts which might get escalated any, any time and uh, which are man-made. They, they could be uh, easily <coughs> avoided in the past and they could be resolved if there is a political will uh, in, 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 in Moscow. To, to, to solve those conflicts. Uh, I think we are making small progress in the Balkans uh, with the uh, uh, accession of North Macedonia. We, we did enlargement to Montenegro. Of course, we still have Bosnia uh, to, 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 to proceed with membership action plan, but, but the biggest danger is uh, those 
Ukraine, uh, Georgia, Moldova, which, which, uh, which uh, people are being di are dying every day, and uh, and we have not been able to to stop to stop them. Okay, th thank you. I agree about the uh, hybrid. <coughs> Uh, warfare, mm, we, are, we are experiencing it in, in Ukraine. So, and uh, the core of uh, mm, this danger is that mm, uh, uncertainty, uncertainty when, from where, and who mm, uh, will uh, uh, practice this hybrid mm, approach. Either it is about the mm, cyber attack, or it is information attack, or it is. Uh, mm, a uh, green man without insignia, or it is a uh, conventional threat, not using, but just a threat, <clears throat> having the tanks on the borders or something, or <clears throat> uh, deploying of nukes. So, but uh, our experience says that it could be used simultaneously, all of them. <clears throat> so, an uncertainty of, uh, of this type of the new war is very, uh, very dangerous. So you want something to uh, difficult difficult really to add but i guess that uh, in the cyber question uh, we focus right now on this i would say, say soft cyber attacks uh, i mean yeah. soft in in the sense these are attacks on uh, people minds the attacks to 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 be to build divisions uh, visible everywhere not only in europe uh, but it, now it, this is more silent about cyber threats coming to the infrastructure, which I guess uh, of the equal, equal importance and uh, very serious consequences when we think about you know, infrastructure, communication, hospitals. Uh, our systems are so much based now on, on, on digital uh, interconnection that uh, it, uh, I guess we, we shouldn't forget about that, uh, and, and uh, definitely that's a very, very vulnerable uh, area. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned, you used, the, the you used the term Western values, and both of you have been speaking about, all of you, about environment changes, including cyber. So m my question is, what, what can smaller states do in their international role in helping to maintain collective security. Uh, smaller states could be seen as subjects of the, the, the whims of these larger states and their, 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 their vacillations in Western values. That an argument could be made. And their, their difficulty in, in dealing with these environmental threats that are emerging from their own territories. What should smaller, sta the if, smaller if, states do? If once, if once you, s you suffer or experience some kind of the attack, uh, you're um, be becoming expert. Look what happened with Estonia in 2007. And Estonia became first ever <coughs> partner of NATO to establish the Cyber <coughs> Center of Excellence. Uh, Latvia is the leader in the European Union well, uh, um, to bring uh, first ever uh, uh, decision of Europe on the, um, on the uh, combat against the disinformation. Uh, Finland is a good partner. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, let's back, uh, look back to the experience of Finland to understand why they are hosting the center of the hybrid warfare in Finland. So <clears throat> these, uh, these countries in, in Baltic states, they are well prepared for that, <clears throat> just based on their experience and they are leading because they have experience, they know how. Yeah. So, but is there, do we, is there evidence that, that these, for example, the center, that I, and I mentioned it in Estonia, there, it is never mentioned in this country, but is there evidence that in other, farther, places in Europe, in Britain, I don't know, in Germany, in Spain, that, that we have these allies, these people in other parts of Europe, and their lives matter to us. Right? They're, they're part, we, are, we, we share some values. It, it's, it's the weakening of those values, that sense of sharedness, and that we're in this together to, uh, secure, to the, guarantee the, our security that the, has me the, wondering. The biggest, uh, the, biggest, uh, <clears throat> the biggest problem and the short answer um, to, to your question is that <clears throat> NATO was created to defend common values. Well, it, it worked during the Cold War. <clears throat> then we entered the post-Cold War period when values <clears throat> uh, 
uh, were substituted by interests. And now the question is how to bring values back. <clears throat> how to bring values back and to, <clears throat> and to build uh, this partnership based on values. What are the values? <clears throat> Where they are? Why disappeared? Interests are playing role. <clears throat> if I may, if I may uh, to complement a little bit, uh, I think uh, size is not a, that decisive thing uh, on speaking about the subjects of our today's discussion. Uh, most important is uh, uh, whether the sort of country's experience is relevant to others. And in case of the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, the, the most interesting is that we we are we have been we are probably the one of the most recent successful laboratories of change uh, metaphorically speaking we jumped from singing revolution into digital revolution mm -hmm. and uh, considering our historical background uh, we are borderliners in geographical location we are borderliners between europe and eurasia with soviet experience we we border russia and belarus so we uh, telescope development very rapidly and uh, we have accumulated quite unique experience of dealing with the uh, on a, from the very early uh, stages uh, with the threats coming from cyber from hybrid and we have accumulated this experience of of uh, resilience if you want um, uh, just uh, to uh, substitute what I'm talking about. In, in Estonia, uh, speaking about the digital platform, uh, the selling uh, uh, selling uh, proposition is very simple. A uh, citizen in Estonia with electronic ID card can do everything online without only with, but two things. You cannot get married, you cannot divorce, you still have to show up with real person. <laughs> and the second thing, you cannot buy real estate and you cannot sell it. You still have to show with real documents uh, to avoid fraud. The rest, and this is, has been going for years, uh, more than 10 years, with one electronic ID, with one passcode, you get um, prescription drugs, you, you, you can uh, do any kind of licenses, you do your taxes, and you can even vote in uh, local elections, in parliament elections. In Latvia you can do the same, but you cannot vote. In Estonia, Estonians have gone even further. And uh, by doing all those things since 1991, uh, our countries have, have learned how to deter cyber attacks. They uh, learned how to uh, keep uh, the vigilance of the people, and, and how to accommodate the pace of technology growth and, and uh, application of those tools by the general public. And uh, those centers uh, run in Tallinn and Riga, those are not no, national centers. There are NATO countries and Na NATO partner countries. For instance, Sweden and Finland, they are participating in those centers. So all like-minded nations are, are welcome. And this is a sort of another university, if you want, uh, where we share our best practices and we raise, we try to raise also public awareness with the UN as well. Not every country is like-minded in the UN, but we are open to talk about the general things. Um, we don't expect new conventions on the UN soon, but uh, we think that some ethical protocols and some understanding of the risks and, and dangers should be should be shared by by everyone because at the end of the day this is also could contribute to sdgs sustainable development goals if we're really serious about achieving them thank you thank you it's really great experience from cyber defense to cyber deterrence really really great experience uh, now i would like to um, give a floor to audience please be concise <clears throat> Um, speak on the topic of our round table and you will have a chance to speak on other topics uh, after this round table. We are, in, we are inviting for the uh, informal reception outside and we have a chance to address the colleagues here. Please. Uh, thank you very much. I, I fully appreciate that you 
focus on NATO based on your historical experience, obviously. And uh, so I, I assume that NATO membership is much more essential than European Union membership. And coming back to Ambassador Radomski's the elephant in the room, considering the fact that the President Trump views the European Union as a foe, so how do you, uh, both of you, how do you reconcile these uh, uh, discrepancies, if you will, or contradictions? And, and to Ambassador Pildegovic, you are uh, you are using euro as your currency, and what are your uh, measures to prevent further Russian money laundering in, by Danish banks in Latvia? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, on the first question, uh, I. It is obvious that we have some disagreements with this administration. Uh, we have climate, we have uh, the Human Rights Council, we have some Golan Heights, most recent uh, announcement. But uh, uh, I can say it uh, putting a hand on the stack of the Bibles. Uh, when it comes to security and defense, NATO is working just fine. It's operational. It's it's uh, it's the only game in the town, if you want. European Union, uh, due to the uh, complexity of the composition of the members, due to the historical legacy, we are still. Well, we are not making baby steps, but we are still in a very very early stage, and. Uh, that doesn't mean that we should not think about it. When it comes to Latvia, uh, we would be uh, ready. We are participating in almost every initiative by the European Union. But uh, just one example, European uh, battle groups have not been used once. They have been created, they have been existed on paper, they have had some training, limited training, but they have never been used for political reasons. We have never had European consensus at the Foreign Affairs Council. Uh, we don't have uh, military uh, planning units sufficient for uh, significant operations. We can do some peacekeeping, but, uh, but uh, we haven't had uh, real fighting experience together on a pan-European EU level. That doesn't mean that we should not look into that. We probably should. But uh, if we do that, uh, it should be gradual, it should be uh, open, of course, to everyone, but not everyone is on board. Uh, even uh, in uh, this new structured cooperation, uh, three countries have opted out. And uh, to be very blunt, uh, we still have to see Brexit outcome, because uh, we don't know exactly is Britain in or out. We, of course, we will, would like to keep as close partnership with UK, no matter what. But but uh, there is a difference if UK is part of European Union or not. Uh, so uh, we, I think we believe we we believe in NATO. We have to do more on European things. But European, in our eyes, European things are remaining uh, is complementary to, 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 to that. Uh, to the second question, uh, we, I agree that uh, there, are, there is significant homework which has to be done uh, by our domestic uh, regulators and uh, banking community, but, uh, but the same uh, goes for uh, overall oversight in Europe and globally as well. Uh, because uh, just one example, uh, when we joined Euro five years ago and when we delegated some of the competences to ECB in Frankfurt, uh, for instance, uh, one example, uh, four largest commercial banks in every EU member state are under supervision from Frankfurt. This is in the law. 
but uh, but when uh, when you have a fire then we discover that uh, there are issues which ECB uh, is taking on there are issues which ECB says we don't have capacity or we don't do nitty-gritty of the oversight this is has to be done by the local authorities so we think that uh, in the future we will have to do a bit of a f- fine-tuning of pan-European regulation as well. But, of course, the biggest homework still has to be done by, by, by our national authorities. And I think, uh, speaking more globally, there is also a quite important process uh, on the Hill in Washington, D.C., when it comes to shell companies, when it comes to uh, offshore uh, oversight on a on a global level because um, things what I'm talking about cannot be uh, immunized and uh, fixed only in the in the Baltics or within euro euro area if it's not addressed on on a bigger level by by legislators in the United States as well because uh, because this is a sort of global phenomenon. Thank you. <coughs> Should I you want to? Yeah. Uh, may I add, since the question was relating to, to the elephant, and, <laughs> and um, yes, it's, it's true, there, of course, in the European Union, uh, the degree of um, friendship or controversy with, with bilateral, in, within the bilateral relations with, with Washington, Will be will be different in in different cases. Poland is uh, perceived and is acting also um, in reality as one of the strongest uh, allies of the U.S. And uh, it's not always easy, uh, especially with the this common security and foreign and security EU policy. Such cases like Iran coming to mind, um, where uh, we try to. I try to underline the, underline the, the question of values, uh, really values which we, which are on which we have built our, our transatlantic community, and uh, uh, which means uh, we should uh, do everything not to weaken this com- this this values based connection. Uh, between USA and, uh, and and Europe, uh, and of course it doesn't m- mean that um, we always will be uh, we always have to act vis-à-vis Washington vis- with the relations with Washington as a as a very united group. That's natural. That uh, um, uh, we will be much eager to have stronger U.S. military presence in in our country than some other countries uh, which will not take it into account at all. So maybe that's only this short comment. Thank you. Questions? A few more questions? Okay. Gentlemen, again, uh, th- thank you for sharing with us your insights uh, on these issues. Uh, my question pertains to, uh, in Ukraine, the, the in Donbass and Crimea, the Russian Federation utilized for justification of their operations the protection of Ru- ethnically Russian and Russian-speaking uh, people. Um, looking across your security space, are there any other areas that, other like, for example, Narva in Estonia, um, what are some of the other areas that you feel are at risk uh, and what actions are you taking uh, to ensure that that justification cannot be used again in the same security space. Really? I'll, I'll, I'll refer to our guests. Yeah. <laughs> because the, the same question, even more so, is, applies to Latvia. Uh, when it comes to our relations with Russia, uh, of course we don't, cho- we don't choose our neighbors, we don't ch- kind of change <coughs> the geography, and when we uh, we are uh, fully cognizant that Russia is a big country, and uh, and uh, over the last twenty eight years we have been uh, trying to to build up relations with Russia. We solved uh, a few significant leftovers from the Soviet fifty years of Soviet presence. Uh, we managed to withdraw about forty thousand Russian troops. 
uh, last troops left uh, in uh, end of August 1998. It took we were the last country to r remove very significant military infrastructure and present and footprint. Uh, we solved the border issue with Russia. We we were the first Baltic states which fully uh, delineated the demarcated border with Russia. We accepted the de facto border upon the moment of restoration of independence. Uh, Joseph Stalin three times changed border to the advantage of Russia in the 40s. Uh, it was difficult debate in the public, in the parliament, but we accepted for the, for the future of the of the of our relations uh, you're right we have uh, the biggest uh, ethnic russian non-latvian population in the baltic states it's about 28 percent uh, we've been uh, for 30 years we've been trying to uh, integrate them into our society uh, we largely we think we largely succeeded uh, when we regained independence, 80% of non-ethnic Latvians didn't speak the language of the country. Uh, now the ratio is the opposite. 80% uh, of non-Latvians are proficient, reasonably proficient. 20, 15% mostly elderly people, they're still struggling. But we've tried, we tried uh, it's not an easy process, but we tried to involve them in the society, we tried to facilitate uh, naturalization of these people, and uh, we are building a coherent political nation, open. Uh, we still fund uh, public education in eight languages, uh, including Russian, and Belarusian, and Polish, uh, and uh, Ukrainian, etc. Uh, we try to do it uh, gradually. Uh, I think quite quite successfully. Uh, for I should touch the wood, but for 30 years since the regaining of independence, we have not had any act of inter-ethnic violence in Latvia. Uh, the rate of uh, inter-ethnic marriages is one of the highest. It's more than 20%. It used to be higher in the Balkans, but uh, after the Balkan Wars, it's considerably down. In the Baltics and Latvia, it's still fairly high. Uh, having the, we have about 60 agreements with Russia. Most of them are functioning. Our bilateral trade is about 12%. Used to be 95 before independence. Now it's about 12. So we are not, uh, we are not, uh, we're still buying Russian gas, but technically we can buy Norwegian or British gas as well. So, and uh, in a couple of years, we will fully uh, disintegrate from the, from the electricity network with Russia and uh, with support of Poland, we will, I think by 21, 22, we will have also fully gas grid fully connected with the Finland and the Poland. So uh, all in all senses, umbilical cords will be cut from, from the old Soviet systems. Uh, of course, that doesn't mean that Russia technically cannot use any kind of false or bogus pretexts for uh, uh, pressures they have been using that in that sense we have built up this resilience for quite a while and we try to resp respond by clearly stating our objectives by doing uh, comprehensive integration into western st structures by educating our society of course we have been trying to raise also our living standards and Currently, it is in all three countries higher than in Russia. So uh, the, there is no appeal for Eurasian integration in, in the Latvian society. Uh, and uh, as we have seen in the last elections in October last year, the appeal of the sort of Russian political parties uh, is, is fading gradually. Uh, continuously, every four years, they get less and less 
uh, votes. Uh, European Parliament elections are coming in May. Uh, last time they had two uh, sort of pro-Moscow, pro-Russian uh, members in European Parliament. My prediction that this time we will have less, most likely one. But I might be wrong. Uh, but uh, uh, these are the answers. And of course, military presence, uh, clarity that every time Russian pilots are in the skies over the Baltic Sea, they are meted and greeted by NATO planes. Same goes with the, uh, with the Navy and same goes with anything else. So... Um, I think this is uh, the in that sense this is the beauty of the current architecture that everything is clear everything is understood and uh, we are talking about the very very small geographic region uh, this is not uh, pacific this is not Kazakhstan where the fly time between the baltic uh, if we are talking about supersonic planes it's this is seconds and minutes and uh, the margin of error is 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 very small. So, uh, in the case of Latvia, we never had any violations of our territory or our airspace for 30 years. We hope that um, every decision maker is is uh, is uh, taking those all those elements in consideration. Uh, so we don't we don't expect uh, classical conventional threats. More threat is more real with manipulations of social media, with cyber attacks, uh, which are which which is almost an everyday phenomena. Thank you. <coughs> okay. So uh, th thank you, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, two um, important issues you raised. <clears throat> um, most probably we'll discuss during the informal meetings for those who have an interest in that. Energy. Energy security is really the part of the, ar ar uh, the whole architecture of, uh, of European Union. And so you know how we are trying to be um, independent, fully independent, working uh, between yourself and thinking how to have the, uh, the new uh, nuclear power station to build. Well, how to... <clears throat> um, uh, how do you have the, 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 the diversity of the, um, uh, of the delivery of energy? Second, what is very important, uh, you, you, you raise now answering the question of, um, uh, of the student here, um, uh, what, what brings the stability uh, in all Baltic states? High level st living standards comparably to neighbors. Uh, if you look at all the um, indexes of the um, human development, economics in Europe, Poland and Baltic states, they are on the top. On the top. <clears throat> so, and this brings some kind of the, uh, of the stability. Of course, uh, they, they have a challenge because it is not a crisis, but it is a phenomenon. People are looking the better, the better places to live. So, unfortunately, there is, <clears throat> uh, there is a migration process. People are moving ahead. And uh, that's why uh, to bring, uh, to, to, to normalize that, to balance the situation, of course, uh, Europe should also care about that. Mm. And uh, not, to, uh, not to push the idea of two-speed Europe, mm. but to, mm, well, to bring equality uh, in, uh, in the distribution of the, uh, of, of the pooled, uh, uh, part of the pooled uh, sovereignty to the, to the Brussels. So that's why we do understand this, uh, this dialogue between them and the Brussels, well, mm, how to um, how to how to the stability more sustainable, mm, how to keep uh, raising the standards. Estonia is doing the fantastic things, um, and 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 the rest as well. So most probably this keeps people uh, uh, from the neighboring neighboring countries to move there across the Narva River. <laughs> they are comparing where is better. They prefer to move to mm, to other side. Uh, thank you very much for mm, mm, accepting the invitation. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for mm, uh, this exchange. We'll have some more time for informal. 
Um, believe me, so the audience is well prepared for that to speak on, on whatever. <coughs> they, they want to, to have to have more information and to bring it to, uh, to the uh, to the students, uh, to their classes. And thank you again. Uh, and Brad, thank you for hosting <coughs> uh, this event. Thank you, and I invite you to the, <coughs> to the next, to the next call. <coughs>